waters roar, there is a stream from the heart of God. The nations stumble after earthly victory. We cry, Abba, Father, King, for His people sing out. Our God, He cannot be moved. The oceans roar and nations raise. In Christ, we have overcome. The war is won because Jesus reigns. Now standing firm in Christ, our refuge and our shield. No need to fear, our God is near. He is on our side. Now come behold the works of Jesus Christ, our King. Be still and know that He is here. For His people sing out. Our God, He cannot be moved. The oceans roar and nations rage. In Christ, we have overcome. The war is won because Jesus reigns. No death, no height, no depth or things to come can separate. separate us from your no high, no depth or things to come can separate us from your oh, oh, oh. Oh. Don't wanna quench your spirit. I don't wanna fight your will. Jesus, you say your teachings well. Teach me. You lead me beside the waters. With you I shall not want. Jesus, you say our thirst will be quenched. Praise be. Well, good morning, family. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you, Scott. Good morning. Um, why don't we stand together? Can we stand together and let's sing as we begin our time? We sing to Jesus, our firm foundation. Here we go. Sing how firm a foundation. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge 
to Jesus after Sing, fear not, fear not, he is with us, so be not dismayed, for he is our God, our sustainer and strength. He'll be our defender and cause us to stand upheld by his merciful almighty hand. How firm, how firm our foundation, how sure our salvation, and we will not be shaken. Jesus, firm The soul that is trusting in Jesus as Lord will press on enduring the darkest of storms. And though even hell should endeavor to shake, he'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. He'll never, he'll never, no, never. No, never forsake how firm our foundation, how sure our salvation, and we will not be shaken. Jesus, firm of his faithfulness age to age she stands faithful to the end all may fade away but he will remain he will remain how firm seated this morning. What is so good to see you this morning, family. My name is Ryan, and I'm one of the pastors here. And as always, we look forward to coming together on, on a Sunday morning into, uh, into this place and worshiping God, engaging with Him. And I know that so many of us come in here in different places. We come in here tired, fatigued. We come in here uh, feeling unworthy. We come in here questioning where God has been. And and this, this is a place where we get to come and encounter God, and we get to come encounter the work of Jesus and his gospel. And so as we start our morning, that's, that's how we begin each and every Sunday here at Summit. It's with the gospel reminder. This is why we come. This is how we come. It's through the gospel. So receive this gospel welcome today for, for all of us who are, are weary and need rest. To those of us who mourn the loss of something or someone and we need comfort. For those of us who have felt like, uh, where has God been in the picture this week and need to be reminded of his care? For those of us who are sinners and need forgiveness and strength, this is the place to be. Because Jesus is here and Jesus' arms are open wide to you because he's the ally of his enemies. He's the defender of the guilty one. He, he's the justifier of all of us who have run out of excuses. And he's the friend of sinners. 
And he says to each and every one of us today, he says, welcome. He says, come. And this church, we extend that welcome to you as well. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. You know, something that Paul encourages us to do is to extend that same welcome we've received in Christ towards those around us. So why don't you stand up, take a few minutes, find a few people to shake their hand, and then we'll keep going here in just a second. All right, friends, let me invite you to make your way back to your seats. You can remain standing as you come back to your seats. We're going to continue our time of worship in uh, responding with a responsive reading today. This is something the church has done for for hundreds of years. It's a way to kind of help focus our hearts on on why we're here. This morning's reading is an adaptation of, of Psalm 115. So I'll read the leader portions. Let me invite you to read the all portions with me. I'll start us. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name we give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Read this with me. Yet because of the sin in our hearts, we have strayed far from you. We have disobeyed your commandments. We have trusted our own judgment, and we wonder why we feel distant from you. We've worshipped idols of silver and gold, really idols of self and comfort, These have no power, these have no soul, these have no life. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Read this with me. Forgive us, gracious God, for not loving you as we ought, for not obeying you, and for not trusting that your ways are better than our own. We run to you today, thankful for the grace and freedom we can know in Christ. The Lord be with you. Let's continue to worship the Lord together today. We sing to the only holy God. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness tremble? Only a holy God. We sing of his beauty. What of the beauty demands such praises? What of the splendor outshines the sun? What of the majesty? with justice only a holy God we come and behold come and behold him, the one and the only cry out sing glory consumes thy fire. What other power can raise the dead? 
what other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. We behold. could rescue me from my failing. Who else could offer only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God. Only a holy My heart has 
grasping in your side long before my first breath running into Just as I am, you pull me in, and I know I need you now. So I'll run to the fire, fall into grace, done with the hide, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend, so I'll run to the Father again. Father, we're so grateful that we can turn to you today, Lord, with all of the things that we bring into this room. We're grateful that we can know forgiveness. We can know right standing before you because of the work of your son, Jesus, on our behalf. God, would you use your word now to convict our hearts, to cause us to see Jesus all the more clearly, our need for him, our identity, our standing in him. We run from the things of this world. We run from the things of our flesh. And we turn to, to you, to your provision. We pray this all in and through Jesus today. And everybody said, amen. Family can remain standing. We're going to read God's word together. We'll be in the book of Galatians this morning, chapter 4. If you want to turn your Bibles to chapter 4, if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and one of these gentlemen walking down the aisle will give you one. If you don't own a Bible, please accept that one as a gift from us. Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Formerly, when you did not know God... You were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray that the power of your word would penetrate our hearts and minds to reveal the glory of Christ, the splendor of his truth. Don't let us remain immune to the life-changing power of your word, O Lord, but rather cause us to drink deeply from the well of grace. And let your word transform our minds, our emotions, our wills into the image of Christ. Grant that we would enjoy and savor the sweet promises of the gospel of grace. Holy Spirit, open eyes that have been blinded by the empty promises of this age and soften hearts made hard by the deceitfulness of sin. Rescue us, O Lord, from this present evil age and cause us to live before you in righteousness and truth and peace as our children go to be taught through the word of God may their hearts and minds as well be impacted and changed may we live to make others glad in you through the gospel we pray in Jesus name amen you may be seated and children you are dismissed Well, it was uh, New Year's Day, 1863. 
The country was uh, entering into its third year of a bloody civil war, what would end up becoming uh, actually the bloodiest conflict in American history. The North and South were divided from each other. There were massive question marks about the, the future of the United States. And as the new year started, President Abraham Lincoln issued what would end up becoming one of the most significant, if not the most significant, proclamation in U.S. history. He announced that, quote, all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforth shall be free. Now that's what we now know as the Emancipation Proclamation, probably what is one of the greatest declarations of human freedom in the history of the world. And in many ways, it it changed the course of the war. What happened after that was that every Union victory in the progress became a victory of emancipation. Everywhere that came under Union control ended up being subject to this new law, this new order, and thousands of slaves were freed. This brutal, oppressive, tyrannical reality of the transatlantic slave trade that had lasted for 250 years, right? Human persons shipped across oceans, millions of them that died on the passage over the Atlantic Ocean. People bought and sold as if they were, as if they were property. Right? People traded based on the color of their skin. I mean, think about it. If you were a slave, at, at best, at best, this would be your situation. Under some type of decently civil master stuck on the the lowest rung of the social order, you and your descendants destined to be owned by others the rest of your day. At worst, you were subject to violence, abuse, sexual assault. I mean, the reality of slavery was horrible. And so, gosh, it's, it's hard for us to even comprehend what it would have felt like to finally be free. And so imagine with me for a moment if a freed slave or even a a family of freed slaves or even imagine an entire community of slaves, imagine if you were to watch that community willingly put themselves back under the oppression and the violence and the mistreatment of slavery. If you cared about those people at all, that would feel disturbing, wouldn't it? You would wonder, why in the world are you willing to walk back into this bondage that you just walked out of? In fact, it would feel probably like all of the efforts of those dying in the cause of emancipation, all of the other slaves themselves who who died sacrificing themselves for this cause of freedom, it would feel as if all of that was in vain, that all of it was for nothing. Friends, that is, in many ways, the exact emotions that the Apostle Paul feels as he writes this passage to the Galatian church. In fact, he says, verse 11, I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. Paul's concern for this church, we've seen this throughout this letter, he's worried about what's happening to their faith, and his fear for them, we see this in these four verses, his His fear for them is that as a church, as an entire community, they are walking themselves back into the very slavery that God had freed them from. And in a lot of ways, that that feeling, that fear for Paul of what this community is doing, walking back into slavery, that isn't an unwarranted fear for Paul. You see, Paul knows the history of God's people. And the story of God's people very much is a story of them doing the same thing. Are you familiar with the story of the Exodus? God had freed his people from the bondage of slavery. He rescued them out of Pharaoh's hand. And he he brings them out of slavery into the wilderness. And it's interesting that Paul, throughout Galatians, uses a lot of the same language that the Exodus narrative uses. In fact, you go to the prophet Hosea And God, looking back on his his own rescue of Israel from slavery, says, Out of Egypt I called my son. 
This language of of slavery and sonship, Paul's so familiar with it, it governs the way he sees what's happening with this Galatian church, that they're at risk of walking back into the very slavery that God's freed them from. This is the pattern over and over again for God's people. In Galatians 4, really in many ways, this entire center of the letter of Galatians helps us understand the nature of these two things, slavery and freedom. Slavery and freedom. These themes are are so central to how we understand this letter, and, and to be honest, they're not just central to how we understand this letter. The ideas of slavery and freedom and how they relate to our spiritual life, they're key to how we understand life, how we understand the gospel, how we understand what it means for us to follow Jesus. And it's why this passage in particular I think is so helpful for us this morning because this passage is going to show us very clearly that there are two unique ways that we can be enslaved. But there's only one way that we can truly be free. And so I want to walk through this passage really helping us to see those three things this morning. These two ways that we can be enslaved, this one way that we can finally and truly enjoy freedom. And so if you have your Bible open, be sure to track with it. You know here at Summit we love to walk through the text, and so I'm going to be pointing in a number of different moments to the text. So have your Bible or Bible app open. Let's jump in here. Number one, I want to show you the first way that Paul shows us here that we can be enslaved. You actually see it here in verse 8. Look at it with me. Paul writes this, formerly, he says, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Now, Paul opens this section reminding these Galatian believers of their life before Christ. If you remember the Galatian story at all, we've come back to it over and over again through this series. Uh, Paul had gone to the, the region of Galatia. He'd begun to share the gospel with them. These people that were not Jewish in their background, they weren't atheist in their background. What was their background? Do you remember? They were pagans, right? They, God had rescued them out of paganism. And Paul says to them, hey guys, look, r- remember that moment before you believed the gospel. Go back to that time before you believed in Christ. Do you remember that time? You were in bondage. Y- you were enslaved. And what was it that you were enslaved to? Well, Paul says it here. You were enslaved to, he says, to those that by nature are not gods. Now, what in the world does that mean? (laughs) Well, let's try and let the passage help us here understand what Paul's talking about. There's a parallel phrase that Paul uses in verse 9. What is it that they were enslaved to? It's what they're at risk of going back to. Paul says that they were enslaved to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world. These are what these Galatians are at risk of going back to. It's it's what they had come out of that they now might be walking back toward. And you go, Ben, well, that really helps me to understand this phrase. Now I have a second question. What in the world are the elementary principles of the world? Well, I touched on this very briefly last week because this phrase actually came up in our passage last week in verse 3. But let me, let me spend a little bit more time on this here this morning. The word behind this phrase, the elementary principles of the world, is the Greek word stoicheia. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, I'm not a Greek expert, but I do read people that are Greek experts, and they very much help in this. They, they would say that this is a notoriously difficult word to translate. It, the word essentially means the, the basics or the ABCs of something. But the way that the word was actually functionally used in the Greco-Roman world was to refer to what in the ancient world were essentially the, the basic elements of the universe. Air, fire, wind, water. Not like the 70s R&B group, earth, wind, and fire. The, the pagan basic elements, the ancient elements that they thought governed the world around them, earth, fire, water, air. So when Paul says that they were enslaved to the stoicheia, he's talking about these elementary principles, these 
the, these foundational elements of the world. Some translations will, will translate this as the, the spiritual elements or the spiritual forces, these things that Paul says by nature are not gods. This is what Paul's saying the Galatians were enslaved to. Now again, you go, Ben, that doesn't really help me still to understand what functionally is going on for them. What in the world is Paul talking about? Well, let me get down to it here. Pagans in the Greco-Roman world essentially believed that behind everything around them, earth, wind, fire, water, sun, moon, stars, harvests, love, war, sex, beauty, death, behind everything was a god. And if, if you wanted or needed the thing that that god controlled, then what you did was work the particular system that you needed to work to, to get those things. You prayed to that God, you made offerings to that God, you, you pledged your allegiance to that God, you essentially worshipped them. And the first century Greco-Roman world was filled with temples and priests and different ways to facilitate that type of pagan worship. In fact, Paul, in, in Acts chapter 17, when Paul goes to Athens, uh, Luke writes about his journey into Athens that Paul's spirit was grieved because the city of Athens was so full of idols. This is the world that Paul writes into. I remember for me personally, my wife and I were missionaries in western China for uh, a number of years, and I remember my own first trip out into the mountains of Tibet in, into a Tibetan Buddhist temple. And you go into this temple, and it's, it's dark, and it's oppressive, and there, there's this, I mean, there's just icons and images and idols of all kinds of different gods and Buddhas, and, and every god of the Tibetan Buddhist pantheon is in there with candles being lit toward them, incense being burned toward them, offerings being made to them. Monks are, are leading in prayers toward these gods that are, in fact, not gods. Now, there, there are spiritual elements behind those realities, to be sure, but they are not the, the capital G God that we serve. And so it, it's disturbing in many ways to watch this play out, right? If any of you have been to another country, you've seen the reality of idolatry still in the world, to watch others bow down and give allegiance and make sacrifices to those that are not gods is a disturbing thing. And so in many ways, you're watching a people that, that feel enslaved, to that reality. And so this is what Paul's saying. He's essentially saying this to the Galatians. You were enslaved by your own idolatry. And friends, in many ways, this is the story of the entire Bible, is slavery to this kind of idolatry. You see, the Bible always has such profound insight into the human condition. And the Bible cl very clearly reminds us that every one of us as human beings were were created to worship, and we will either worship the God who made us, or we will turn to worship something else. And that something else will always, always, always enslave us. Now, maybe you go like, Ben, come on. Worship of idols? Like, th this is 2023. We are in America. We're not pagans. I don't exactly see temples and images and idols that people around me are worshiping everywhere in America. Hmm. Let me ask you, what is it that 100 million people are going to turn on their TV to this afternoon at 3.30 p.m.? <laughs> no. And that a significant number of those people will, will have the next year of their life either living or dying by the result of what happens at 3.30? Why is it that advertisers spend $7 million for a 30-second spot on that said show to get the eyes of your attention, to get, might I say, your worship? We very much live in a society filled with idols. Now, idolatry might look a little different than it did 2,000 years ago, but the reality is there nonetheless. So, so let me ask, what is an idol? 
Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great British preacher of the last century, he defined an idol this way. I, I feel so helpful. It's going to be up on the screen here. He said, an, an idol is anything in my life that occupies the place that should be occupied by God alone. In other words, an idol is, is that which is not a God turned into a God. Anything that holds my life and my devotion, that's central in my life, that seems vital, anything that's essential to me, that moves and rouses and attracts and stimulates me is an idol. An idol is anything to which I give much of my time and attention, my energy and money, anything that holds a controlling position in my life is an idol. Do you hear what Lloyd-Jones is saying? He, he's saying that idols are those things, those people, those ideas that become what we worship in our life. And it could be a million different things, status, success, autonomy, comfort, materialism, there's political idolatry, ideological idolatry, idolatry of self and family and tribe and country. We can worship a career, we can worship a relationship, we can worship an ideal, we can worship a dream, we can worship a certain way of life. I mean, the, the list is endless. But the reality is this is such a basic principle of life that we need to get whatever it is that we worship will ultimately enslave us. It just will. Now the question is, how? How does that work? Well, David Foster Wallace was uh, an acclaimed author and thinker, not, not a believer in Christ, but just a guy who through common grace had genuine insight into the human condition. Back in 2005, he gave a very famous commencement speech to the graduating students of Kenyon College in Ohio. And the, the speech was just super insightful in terms of helping us see how our worship of something ultimately will in, enslave us. And so let me read part of this to you. Track along with me. He said this, there is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, I would very much argue that not just any God is the right one to give our worship to. However, choosing some sort of God, the reason to do that is that pretty much anything else that you worship will eat you alive. He, he recognizes this reality that what we worship will ultimately enslave us. Then he gives an example. He says, if you worship money and things... If they, are where, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. I mean, isn't that the truth? I mean, even, even billionaires are not satisfied because what are they comparing themselves to? The other billionaires around them, oh, you have five houses and a Gulf Stream. I only have three houses and a Learjet, right? There, there's never enough to satisfy and so, friends, even for every one of us, it, it doesn't matter what level of raise you get in your job, what status that allows you to have, what a comfort it allows you to live in. If that is ultimate, it will never be enough. And if you make it ultimate, it will enslave you. Worship your body, he says, and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. Because you'll always be comparing yourself. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb your own fear. Worship your intellect and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. And then he says this, but the insidious thing about these forms of worship is that they are default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day. I mean, that's profound. And this is the basic principle of the human condition, that we, we will chase whatever we think will give us our idea of the good life, whatever we think will give us worth and value and identity and security and safety, whatever we think will justify our existence, whatever we think will give us salvation, we we chase those things. That's what worship means. 
G.K. Chesterton once said, when we cease to worship God, we don't become atheists. We don't worship nothing. We worship anything. But here's the thing. Whatever we worship apart from God will always promise us what it can't deliver on. It'll promise us what it can't deliver on. That's why it locks us into this cycle. And this is what Paul's getting at. He says this to these Galatians. Before you knew Christ, this was you. You were enslaved to what you worship. But the reality is the, the, the whole reason that Paul writes this, presses them on this tendency toward idolatry, is that that tendency doesn't vanish just because we meet Jesus. It still continues to to operate in every one of our hearts. Look at what Paul writes here, verse 9. He says this, but now, right, there's this change that happened. Now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles? What descriptors for them, right? These things are weak and worthless. They can't deliver what they promise. And Paul says, how can you turn back again to those whose slaves you want to be once more. And friends, it's so easy for us as, even as Christians, without even thinking, without even noticing it, this can be so subtle for us to just slide back into the slavery of idolatry in our own lives. But the question is, how do you know? Right? How do you know that about yourself? How do you know what it is that you're actually worshiping. And let me give you just really practically three quick diagnostics for yourself. The first is this, follow the trail of your time, talent, and treasure. Follow the trail of your time, talent, and treasure. If, if you were to look down the road at where you put your energy and your money, and your thoughts, and your dreams, and your affections. I mean, let, let me ask you even this. This is such a good question for yourself. When you have a moment to daydream, what is it that you daydream about? On the other side of that question, where, where does that trail of your time, talent, treasure lead? On, on the other side of that will often be what it is that you are actually worshiping. And so that's for a second your emotions will always reveal your idols. Your emotions will always reveal your idols. I wonder how many of you regularly ask yourself the question, why? If you go through something in life, you react in some way to something that's in front of you, you feel certain things about a person or a situation or a conflict that's happened, a hardship that you've faced, you, you feel certain things about it, but do you ever ask yourself the question, why? Why is it that I'm reacting like this? Why do I feel angry or frustrated? Why does this bother me so much? Why does this particular thing make me so happy? Why am I so distraught? Why do I feel on the edge of despair about this thing? Friends, what you're going to find often is that as you question your own emotions, it's going to start to bring to the surface the very things that are the idols of your own heart, the things that you're worshiping. The third, third diagnostic question, we need to realize that idolatry for us is always the sin underneath the sin it's always the sin underneath the sin and so when you when you fail to obey god when you find yourself to be critical or ungenerous or self-centered when you when you bend the truth or you are argumentative or when you self-medicate with food or alcohol or pornography when you're lazy and you waste time like all of those things i mean on the surface they they are sinful actions in and of themselves but let, let me tell you there's a deeper sin underneath the sin and so to ask yourself, what, what is it actually under the surface that, that I'm worshiping, that I'm giving my allegiance to, that, that's causing these sinful actions to come out? So these, these are diagnostic questions that we just need to ask ourselves, right? There's, there's something under all of this that we're ultimately worshiping, that we're giving our allegiance to. And so this is what Paul's saying. This is the first way that we can be enslaved by giving our worship and allegiance to those who by nature are not God's. But this passage actually gives us a second way to be enslaved 
that's quite shocking. You see, Paul says here, hey, Galatians, you guys are, are walking back into slavery. You're walking back into the very pagan idol worship that God just freed you from. But let, let me ask you, if you've been tracking along with this book so far, if you've been following the problem for this Galatian church, anywhere in this book so far have we seen the Galatians at risk of returning to their pagan practices? No. But what has been the risk for these Galatians? It's that they would become so consumed with obedience to the law, with their own self-justification, with their own moralism, with their own moral superiority. It's that those things would become so front and center that they would forget Christ. And the, the shocking thing about this passage, friends, is that Paul's saying that religious idolatry is as dangerous as pagan idol worship. Their obedience to the law, their goodness, is as much of a problem as their pagan badness. <laughs> I mean, that is striking. And church, I think as, as much as any other form of idolatry, th this kind of religious idolatry needs to be on our radar because it so easily flies under the radar. John Wesley, the, the great hymn writer and evangelist, back when he was a, a postgraduate student at Oxford University back in the 1700s, he, he led a group at the university dedicated to living a devout Christian life. The, the group was called the Holy Club. And the club visited inmates in prison. They provided food for children in the slums. They observed both Saturday and Sunday as the Sabbath. They went to church multiple times during the week. They gave alms. They studied the scriptures. They fasted and prayed. John Wesley even went to America and spent several years as a missionary in Georgia among one of the Indian tribes there. But several years after that, he wrote this in his journal. He wrote, I went to America to convert others to God, but I myself was never converted. He realized that on the surface what he'd been doing looked religious, it looked pious, it looked devout. But in reality what he was doing was trusting in his own righteousness to save him. He was making an idol out of religion. He wrote later, looking back at that time, that he had the faith, he said, of a servant, but not the faith of a son. Man, it's so easy for us to be there. It's, it's totally possible for us to exist, to live life within the four walls of the church and look cleaned up and put together and yet be totally enslaved to our own goodness, to end up worshiping religion and not actually worshiping God. This is what comes up over and over again in this letter, and it's what's going to keep coming up right until we finish in, in chapter 6, because what can happen is that we, we start to treat Christianity, we, and this is what was happening for the Galatian church, they were beginning to treat Christianity as if it was a different form of paganism. That we work some type of system, we do our part, we give our worship and our obedience and our good works and our allegiance and, and God responds to us to the degree that he's satisfied with our performance at those things. All of us ultimately gravitate toward the assumption that we are justified by our level of sanctification. And when we take that posture, it, what it does is it shifts the focus from Christ and his finished work to me and the, the adequacy or inadequacy of my own work. And th friends, that is paganism. That's paganism. We do our part either poorly or well, and we, we expect God to do his. I've used this illustration before, but I'm just, I'm going to keep using it because for me, it's just so helpful to understand this framework. It's like so often we treat God as this cosmic vending machine, right? Where, where we put the coins in, we put our own good works, our piety, our faithfulness, our good parenting, our integrity at work, our faithfulness to our spouse, 
our moral uprightness, and we, we press the button, right? C1. That's the good life that I want from God. And when that's not what comes down the chute, when our ideas of what life is going to look like aren't what comes out to us, what happens? We get angry or we fall into despair. Because all along we've been treating God like some type of pagan deity who's not a God at all. Good things in life can so easily become for us ultimate things. And so you think, you know, oh yeah, I'm, I'm parenting for God's glory. But then what happens when your child goes off the rails? Does it cause you to lose faith in God? Maybe all along you've been treating him as this transactional reality to get you the successful, well-adjusted kids that you want to have. Right, we are stay self-controlled and sexually pure in a dating relationship, thinking that, yeah, I'm following this biblical sexual ethic, and then you get into marriage, and intimacy is hard. Things just don't go the way that you thought they might, and you go, God, all along, right? I was doing it the right way. Where's my reward? <laughs> right, where's the thing coming out the chute? Friends, again, this is, this is paganism. And there's some of you here this morning that I know are just are, are frustrated with God. You feel bitter, you feel angry, God's let you down, but I, I wonder how much religion for you. God himself has become just a pagan deity that you've done your piece to get his favor and his merit. Friends, God is not a system for us to work. What he is, though, is a father for us to know. And this is the key in this passage, I think, to true freedom. And if we are, like the Galatians, running the risk of, of falling back into slavery constantly, if we run the risk of falling back both into this kind of non-religious slavery through idolatry there and, and a more religious type of slavery through religious idolatry, if this is the risk that we, that we constantly run, then let me ask, how in the world can we actually be free? Well, the answer is tucked right here, I think, in this little phrase that Paul uses in verse 9. He says this. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. That's interesting. Why, why is it that Paul makes that little clarification there? Now that you've come to know God, or, or rather, to be known by God. Now, Paul's not correcting himself here, right? Paul certainly thinks that the journey of the Christian life is a journey of us knowing God in deeper and deeper ways. So Paul's not pitting these two things against one another, but it's almost like Paul realizes as he's writing this that the much deeper truth of the Christian life is not just that we know God as if this is some type of relationship that we have initiated ourselves and we've reached out to God and we're the ones who sustain this relationship and move it forward. No, that kind of idea is paganism. Right, that, that we are the sole initiator of this relationship. That is a pagan idea. And it's almost like Paul in this moment goes, I, I don't want you to confuse the Christian faith at all with paganism. So let me clarify. It's not just that you know God. It's that before you ever knew God, before you ever searched for God, before you ever reached out to him, before you ever even thought of calling on his name, you know what? You were known by him. He knew you. What Paul's saying is that we don't just serve some type of pagan deity, but we, we have come to be known in this relational way by a Father who loves us. And friends, that changes the whole system, doesn't it? In fact, I would say it, it breaks the system. You see, do our idols love us? Does our morality love us? Does the law love us? No, these are things that we don't exist in relationship with whatsoever, but, but God, our Father, does. And being known by him and loved by him, friends, that's not a matter of what we bring to the table. Right? In fact, we, we bring nothing except our own failure and idolatry and sin. 
And yet we, we come to the God who not only loves us, but who has done everything in the sending of his own son to live, die, and rise again for us. He has done everything needed. We have done nothing. He has done all to bring us into his family. And so we bring all of our garbage, and what we get in return is the lavish mercy and grace that flows to us in Christ. And this, this changes the game of what freedom means. You see, what is real freedom? I mean, that's the question in many ways that this letter itself is asking, and it's the question in many ways driving our culture right now. I mean, it, personal freedom and autonomy, the ability for me to be who I want to be, when I want to be, with whom I want to be it with, and have no one to restrain me in that headlong pursuit. I mean, that is the ideal driving modern American culture on every level, and that is a bipartisan issue, by the way. Right? It's the reality pervading our culture. But the irony of it is that the, the very pursuit of what looks on the front end like, like ultimate freedom, what does it ultimately end in? It ends in slavery. It's like trying to fill up this bottomless pit. It will just never be enough. And you're left enslaved to sin and to self and to the spirit of the age. And yet, this is the irony, friends, that the very thing that looks to the modern person like the epitome of bondage, right, to be known and possessed by the God of the universe, I mean, this is it, right? God, God has saved you. He's adopted you, and he knows you. That, if that's the case, if Jesus has done everything and you have done nothing, if he knows every part of you, it means that, that for all intents and purposes, there is no corner of your life that is not now owned by him. There is nothing that you can keep to yourself. He lays claim over everything. You are not your own. And from this side of the picture, that looks like the ultimate slavery, the ultimate bondage. And yet this is the irony of it all, that actually putting ourselves under that master, that kind of slavery to a father who loves us and who has sacrificed his own son for us, that right there is the pathway to the only true kind of freedom that we will ever experience, the freedom that you and I were created for, the worship of the God who made us. Friends, that's where real freedom is, and it's where f real freedom is for you today, whether you find yourself enslaved, not knowing Jesus, struggling, not even knowing what idols you have right today, you can be free in Jesus. If you are already a Christian, friends, this is what we go back to over and over and over again. We, we root out those idols. We ask the questions of ourselves and Lord, what am I worshiping? And we run headlong back to the only God who is actually a God, <laughs> the one who's loved us and given his son for us. And so let's run to him together this morning. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your great love for us. We repent this morning. Lord, every one of us in this room has idols <laughs> that we slide into serving. And Lord, what we want to do is just not stop repenting, not stop coming back to you and saying, God, free us from those, free us from those, free us from those through your son. Lord, we turn our eyes, our, our affections, our vision, our worship back to you, reorient us, reset us. Lord, transform us this morning by your spirit and by your grace, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. pray that our God would be our vision.
is satisfied in him. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou Sing to our King this morning. Come to the table, I want to encourage you to just take a minute this morning. You know, always when we gather together, the Holy Spirit works through His Word, and, and there's ways that He's wanting to work in you this morning. And so I want to encourage you to take a moment before you come to the table, maybe ask yourself some of those diagnostic questions. Right? What is it that the trail of your time, talent, and treasure shows you're worshiping? Your emotions reveal your idols. What is it that you've been responding to, reacting to? What, what's underneath that? Is it, are there idols of comfort or autonomy? Idols of you know, other people's perception of you or your own perception of yourself? Have you been worshiping safety and security? What is it that you've been after? What, what are those sinful actions that maybe underneath them actually reveal some of the deeper idols of your own heart? Take a moment with the Lord. Just to let him examine your own heart and wrestle with those things. And when you're ready, come to the table. This reminder of the free grace of Christ for, for us who are full of idolatry. Right? The, Jesus' death is for idol worshipers like us. And so we can come to the table offering nothing but our own sin this morning in exchange for his righteousness and his grace for us. So I'm going to pray, and then when you're ready, come to one of the tables. The way that we partake of the Lord's Supper here, if you're new, is we have three tables, two at the front and one at the back. Each of the tables has gluten-free bread and a choice of juice or wine. There'll be someone serving at each of the tables. If you've trusted in Jesus for your salvation, this table's for you. Come and celebrate with us. We come and do this in groups of six, eight people, gather around the table, and remember together the grace of God to us in Christ. So let me pray, and then when you're ready, come to one of the tables. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that through your death, through the blood that you spilled, we now can be declared righteous. We now can be treated not, not even just as we are, but just as if we were you, possessing the righteousness that only belongs to you. And so as we come, remind us of that grace, transform us by that grace. May we come and feast on the goodness of what you've provided. In your name we pray, amen. Friends, come, let's partake together.
All right, church. Well, so so good to be together. Um, if you're new or visiting here, I want, to, I want to give you a special welcome as we end the service as well. Um, we are a church that simply desires to know and make known the real Jesus in our church together with one another, in the city that we live in, and around the world. And uh, if you're interested in getting to know us more, we'd love to get to know you. Just grab one of these little connect cards in the back of the seat, fill out the back, drop it into one of the give boxes that you'll see around the church, those really ugly steel boxes. Um, or even better than that is bring it by the connect desk right at the, right at the front of the church, and there's a little gift bag. If you're a first-timer here, uh, we have a little gift for you that you can grab. Also, if you're new at Summit over the last several months, uh, we would love for you to join us in just a couple of weeks. At the end of the month, last Sunday of the month, uh, February 26, we have our newcomers lunch. It's a great time right after church to just kind of hear a little bit more about who Summit is, what our vision and values are, get to know our history as a church, as well as um, the, the pastors here get to know our stories a little bit. And uh, it's just a fun time around good food together. So I want to encourage you to sign up for that. You can do that either online through our website or our church center app or right at the, um, the connect table right out there. There's a, a physical um, analog sign-up sheet. You know, we don't all have all digital. So go ahead and sign up on there and join us at the end of the month. Um, I want to just thank you, church. Um, the last several months uh, financially for this church have been um, just an incredible statement of God's provision and your generosity. And so I, I want to just say, number one, just a huge thank you to your generous hearts. I feel like it's allowing us as a church to really think strategically of how God's called us on mission in the in, in this place in Pierce County in particular and want to encourage you as well if you're just like I have no idea how to give here that's great number one that's a good thing if you have no idea um, it's in the background but there are two give boxes there that you can give physically you can always sign up online through our church center app and uh, do recurring giving on there so know that there's some pathways uh, if you want to support the mission that God's accomplishing uh, through this little church we'd love for you to do that that way a couple other quick announcements one is our uh uh, well, one is we had an awesome time. Anybody smell bacon when you come in the church this morning? The fire department showed up yesterday uh, during our men's breakfast because there was the smell of uh, bacon smoke. That was exciting. Uh, but ladies, your week is this week. So ladies' Bible study starts uh, this week. You're going to be studying through the book, uh, Trusting God by Jerry Bridges, a really great book, a 12-week study in that. Uh, you can sign up for that online as well. It's Wednesday night. Right here, 7 till 8.30, it's going to be a great time for you ladies to be together. Um, other things that are happening, be sure to check your bulletin. There's lots of different things coming up, so uh, check out the calendar. Get signed up for our e-newsletter so you're aware of what's happening in the life of the body. But I want to invite you to stand, and I want to send you out into the places you live, work, learn, play. Uh, this week, you are going to make the real Jesus known, the glorious God in the midst of idols. You're going to make the real and true God known in all kinds of powerful ways. And so go out knowing his blessing with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go out in his peace. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Yes. Troubles are on the rise. For Jesus, you said our harvest is blessed. Show me when shadows. And